Good morning, everyone. I see everyone's faces. Good morning to all of our YouTube uh, visitors and family members and so forth. Uh, it's definitely wonderful to be in the house of the Lord again Sunday morning. So if you wouldn't mind, we're going to just go dive right into it. A little bit of, little bit of stuff to cover this morning, so I don't want to waste too much time. So why don't you go ahead and turn your uh, Bibles, if you have them, open up to the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, starting in verse 1. While you're going there, we'll uh, recap a few things. So we're taking this big idea about being in Christ, and I want to ask a different question about being in Christ. That is, when Paul wrote the book of Ephesians, what was it according to the book of Ephesians? Being in Christ. Because a lot of scholars, a lot of theologians, a lot of people that have small and capitalized letters at the end of their last or name, you know, people that don't have very much to do on their free nights, except they just study the Word of God, all agree that in Ephesians, you read a lot about your identity in Christ, about who you are. And remember, when you find out who you are, you'll know what to do. So I'm going to ask you to do me a favor, starting today. Read the book of Ephesians. Read through it, not just once. Read through it as many times as you can. And as you read through it, I want you to circle, underline, Absorb every time you see in him, in Jesus, in the beloved. Because it's all the same concept. Okay? Even though there's different words, him, Jesus, and beloved, it's all the same concept. It's having our identity in him. The idea is, is to get into the word of God and have the word of God get into you. Okay? That's the idea. Right? Because you're not going to go out there and, and we don't, as a Christian, we shouldn't be out in the world performing. That's not the idea. That's not our identity. Our identity is in Christ. Our identity is to glorify and honor him in all things that we do. And so the question then is, how does Paul start this letter to the Ephesians? You see, Paul started this church, this this gathering in, in Ephesus. And he spent about two years there, pastoring and teaching and ministering. Now these are people that he knows and he loves. You, you just don't go someplace and spend at least two years there and not build up some relationship. And Paul sometimes in his writing, in writing in his letters, he wrote them while he was in prison. Now here's... Something I'd like to ask you. If Paul was writing these letters to these churches that he started, could you imagine if his identity was in his freedom or his performance or his public reputation? Could you imagine him being guided and governed and directed by the Holy Spirit if his identity was in those things? which obviously they weren't. That encounter that he had on the Damascus Road changed his whole way of looking at things. And it changed his identity to be in Christ. So now in Ephesians 1, and I want to point this out, in verses 3 through 14, and it's in the, Greek, in the, the original Greek, that's one big long sentence. Okay? There's no punctuation. It's a punctuation nightmare for some English majors. But it, there is. It's one big, long sentence. You see, but it's still inspired by the Holy Spirit. Even though it's poorly punctuated, it's still the Word of God. And I want you to read it. And I want you to gather it in. Because we're going to be going over that this morning. I don't know if we're going to get to verse 13. We'll see how this goes. We'll see how the Holy Spirit leads. But what we're going to do is we're going to look at nine things right up front, right in the beginning, of what it means to be in Christ. Okay, so, first one. 
It's where we're going to begin, Ephesians 1.1. He says, Paul, in Christ, you can be faithful. So, to the saints, and that's what we're going to be talking about in the next coming weeks, who are in Ephesus, who are in, in Ephesus and are faithful in Jesus Christ. So, question. Have you ever struggled with spiritual faithfulness? Have you ever backslidden? And have you walked away from God? Have any of you been inconsistent? Have you stumbled or tripped or fell off of that narrow path? There's only one individual I know that has never, ever, ever stubbed his toe or skipped a beat. And that is Jesus Christ himself. Have you... Have you any sin on the side? Things you're hoping that no one else doesn't find out about. Have any of you struggled with faithfulness? With perseverance is another word we can use. Have you asked yourself, how can I become more disciplined? That's a word nobody likes. Discipline. How can I become more faithful? You see, the answer is... In Christ. You can only be faithful in Christ. When you remember who you are, then you'll know what to do. When you know who Christ is for you, in you, through you, you see, that affects the decisions you make and the life you live. Listen to what this one gentleman, how he puts it. There are seasons of my life, as I look back on, that I have been unfaithful unfaithful to God, unfaithful to his people. And he said, you know, I struggled with this for years. And he said, as I was thinking about it, and as I was tempted or frustrated, I just remember myself, I remind myself, I'm in Christ. And he said, actually, this week, very uh, practically, I was tempted to go back into an old sin. Tempted to go back into some old ways. And I remember I'm in Christ. And what that means is I don't have to do that. I don't need to have this inconsistency. I don't need to live out of a double dealing identity. Reversible jersey. I'm in Christ. So in Christ you will live a faithful life. In Christ you can live a consistent life. In Christ, you can live a persevering life. Because if you abide in him and, ab and he abides in you, you can bear much fruit. Does that make sense? You say amen at the end of that. So there's your hope. So you might ask, how is this different than self-help? How is this different than any type of motivational speaking or whatever? Oh, it's really totally different. You see... It's Christ's help. Listen to this. It's, it's, it's amazing how Satan is a crafty deceiver. He just likes to twist a few things to make it so good. You see, it's not about me living a life that glorifies God. Doesn't that sound good? That my life is glorifying God. But that's not what it's about. You see, this is about God living a life through me that glorifies God. But it's God's life in me. It's God's life through me. It's not just me. It's not just my life for him. It's his life through mine. You see, I told you, Scripture, the, the book, uh, our Bible, Christian Bible, the Word of God, it is nothing about me. It is all about Jesus. It's for me to grow, to learn, to understand, to walk, and to know who I am in Christ. So his life can be lived through me to glorify himself. You see, in Christ you can be faithful because Christ was faithful. He never rebelled. He never sinned, he never strayed, and guess what he never did? Be, guess what else he never did? He never repented. He didn't have to. 
The one thing we must do frequently and continually is the thing that he never had to do, and that's repent. You see, he's without sin. He's perfect. Christ alone is faithful, and he's faithful to us. And even when we're faithless, the Bible says he's what? He's still faithful. And it's the faithfulness of Christ to allow us, that, that allows us, to live out that faithfulness of Christ. So that's the first thing. The second thing that Paul says is, in Christ you are blessed. Ephesians 1.3 Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. Now go to verse 6. Ephesians 1.6 He says, he has blessed us in the beloved. Have you ever felt cursed? Have you ever felt like your life is not what it should be? You're working hard, but you're not getting the promotion. Maybe you're working hard and you don't even keep the job. You see, relationally, you're investing in people and they're not, they do nothing but taking from you. Do you feel like your life is one in which you're cursed? That others are just taking. They're greedy, not generous, financially, emotionally, spiritually, practically. Have you ever woke up and looked in the mirror and wondered, is everyone using me? Is everyone taking from me? Does no one care about me? Is no one giving anything to me? You see, in Christ, you're blessed. Sometimes that's financial, sometimes that's emotional, sometimes that's physical. But I'm here to tell you, all the time, that's spiritual. You've been blessed with the righteousness of Christ. You've been blessed with the love of Christ. You've been blessed with the forgiveness of Christ. You've been blessed with a guaranteed resurrection from the dead and an eternal life in Christ. You see, we deserve help. Everything else is a blessing. So you are blessed. And I want to be careful how I say this. I don't want you to become lazy. I don't want you to stop striving. I don't want you to stop growing. But I do want you to have an attitude of gratitude. Where looking around your life, you assume that God blesses you. And you look for the ways that he has blessed you. And when he does bless you, I want you to start to get in the habit of pausing, even momentarily. It doesn't have to be you have to drop to your knees, just to stop momentarily and prayfully thank him. If you woke up from a nap, I love having afternoon siestas. And when I wake up from that nap, I just get up and go about my business. Shame on me. We should get in the habit of just stopping and saying, Father, thank you for that now. You might think it's insignificant. You might think it's like some immature thing. But it's really not. Because without him, we wouldn't have any of it. So just to thank him for the little things just helps you understand and guide you into really thanking him for the major things. You and I are blessed, but sometimes we're blinded to the blessing. It's not that it's not there. It's not that we've closed our eyes. It's that we're so consumed with wanting something else or mourning something that we didn't obtain that we forget to appreciate and praise God for what he's already provided. I want my wife to know she's a blessing, not a burden. I'm the burden. I fully get that, believe me. But she's a blessing. And when God provides things in our life, I try as I'm able to tell people, hey, that came from the Lord, you know. He's good to us, and that's his provision. He answered our prayer, and this, and this comes from his hand. Because in Christ, 
there is blessing. Now the truth is, we only see perhaps a small amount of the blessing in this life, and the rest is waiting for the life to come. So it's not that God is withholding blessing. It's that he's storing it up so that we can enjoy it eternally. You see, in Christ you are blessed. Every situation has a blessing for those who are in Christ. I want to go back to our original parents. I want to go back to Adam and Eve. When God formed them, they were in the garden. What was the one thing that Satan tempted them with? One fruit. The fruit of knowledge. Good and evil. One fruit. They had everything else. But they never saw it as gratitude. They looked at the one thing they couldn't have. Because that's what Satan does. Satan tempted, Satan crafty words first came and said, did God really say so? Let's, let's judge the word of God. Let's see how authoritative it is. And then did he really say, if you ate of that fruit, that you would be like God when they were already like God? He drew their eyes totally away from everything God provided. Number three, in Christ you were chosen and made blameless. This is Ephesians 1.4. He, that's God, chose us. You see, he chose us. How? In him. That's in Christ. Before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. You see, in Christ, he says, you're chosen and made blameless. Let me ask you another question. Has anyone ever chosen you? You see, were you the kid in school that had boiled down to you in a chair? And the people that were making the decisions went, well, we'll take the chair. You see, you were never chosen. You never picked. And sometimes that hurts. Well, a lot of times it hurts. But see, in Christ, you are chosen. How many of you feel, how many of you feel that way? How many of you feel like you're not chosen? How many of you feel like you're just standing off in a corner all by yourself? You might say, yeah, I, I never get picked for anything. You're never chosen, you're never favored, you're never graced that way. But in Christ, you are chosen. This is not something for Christians to debate about. It's not something for Christians to ask the wrong questions about. It's something for Christians to delight in. This is where salvation is of grace. You're chosen in Christ. Again, there are two teams. We went over this last week. Two categories. You're either in Adam or you're in Christ. If God chooses to save you, to love you, to adopt you, you're chosen in Christ. Not only that, to be also holy and blameless in Him. Now the truth is in the eyes of others. We can appear fairly holy and blameless. Unless they're our spouse and then they know everything and they see all of our ugly stuff. You see, but we can fool other people. Your co-workers, your friends, people in your community. Those of you who you have just some sort of passing relationship. You can fool some of the people some of the time, right? But God sees all. God knows all. And this is what it means to live quorum Dio, which means in the face of God. That God sees and knows all, and then he has chosen you. If you're in Christ, so that you can live holy and blameless in his sight. So, here's my next question. Have you ever felt dirty? Have you ever felt, I'm not clean, I'm dirty? Things I've done. 
they're dirty. Things I've thought, they're dirty. Things I've said, they're dirty. Sometimes even desires I still have, they're dirty. They're not clean, they're dirty. They're not holy, they're unholy. They're not godly, they're ungodly. Have you struggled with that? Or am I the only one? How many of you committed a sin that you feel like that has become your identity? You're the worst day of your whole life. That's what you've done. And then that's who you are. But see, that's not true. Who you are is who you are in Christ. What you've done is a sin. It may explain you, but by the grace of God, it doesn't have to define you. It may be something that was in your past, even in recent, even in recent past, but it doesn't need to be in your future, including your immediate future. How many of you have been sinned against in a way that you feel dirty or defiled? Maybe you don't know who your dad is or he walked, he walked out of your life or he mistreated you or abandoned you or abused you. He betrayed you. And perhaps it was even your mother. Or someone said that they loved you and then they ran off with someone else. Or they said they were devoted to you and then they committed adultery on you. Or they did violence against you emotionally, physically, spiritually, sexually. Suddenly you feel defiled. You feel unclean. You feel as if your identity is in what others have done to you and their sin against you. You see, if you're in Christ, you are holy. See, again, Jesus took your place and he put you in his place. You're holy and he says that you're what? Blameless. And I want you to know this about yourself. I don't usually feel that way. We don't normally feel that way. We don't believe we can be holy individuals or we can be blameless individuals. But in Christ, we're chosen and then we're made holy and blameless in Christ. It also says in Romans, Paul writes, there is now no condemnation for those who are what? In Christ. Do you think Paul's got an idea going here? Do you think the Holy Spirit is really trying to teach God's people about an identity? You see, in Christ, you're not dirty, you're clean. Now, some will say, you can't tell people that. They'll just start sinning like crazy. Not if you're in Christ. You see, if you are in Christ, then you'll be grateful for Christ. So thankful for Christ, so in love with Christ, that the last thing you'll want to do is to betray Christ. They won't want to abuse their new identity. They won't want to embrace their new identity. They'll be so grateful that they can change and grow and mature that they will not want to revert back to their ways in Adam. You see, in Christ, you're holy. His perfection is your perfection. In Christ, you are blameless. God does not have a list with your transgressions, your failures and offenses. He does not look for a way to condemn you or to punish you. You see, this frees, you, this frees us up to live out of the righteousness of Christ and to live for the glory of Christ. You see where this is different than religion? See, I want you to be motivated by guilt. I don't want you to be motivated by shame. I don't want you to be motivated by fear. See, perfect love casts out all fear. I want you to know who you are in Christ so you can begin to live the life that Christ has for you. And that's Christ's life in you and through you. In Christ, you were chosen for this and you can be made holy and blameless. 
Now, Paul continues on, and he says, In Christ you are forgiven, Ephesians 1, 7. In him, see how many times? How many times do we have to have a V8 moment? So many of you read the Bible, including myself, and missed 216 times the idea, the concept of in him, in Jesus, in the Beloved, in Christ. It's there over and over and over. In Him, we have redemption through His blood and forgiveness of our trespasses. In Christ, you are forgiven. You have every... Have you ever felt punished? Have you ever felt like, man, life is hard right now because God is punishing me? This is a difficult season. But I brought it on myself. The Lord is angry with me and he's punishing me. Have you ever felt like that? Let me say this. In Christ, you're forgiven. You're forgiven, not punished. You see, Jesus died in your place for your sins. And when he said it is finished, that's what he meant. And so he traded places with you. So you're in the place of forgiven. And he's in the place of of condemnation. That's what happened on the cross. That's where we went through the book of Isaiah in the substitute servant. Jesus took our place on the cross. He took all of our condemnation, all of our sin, all of our damnation, all of the wrath of God and put it upon himself. What did we get? We got what we didn't deserve. We got all the blessing. We got all the hope. We got all of our salvation. All the love, all the forgiveness, all the redemption, all the sanctification that he deserved and deserves. That's how much he loves us and still loves us. So what that means is in Christ you are forgiven. You're forgiven for things you haven't done, even done yet. You're forgiven for things you will do. And fail to do tomorrow. See, sometimes we have this ability to look back on our life and say, yes, Jesus forgave all my sin. But today, I'm ruined. Or tomorrow, when I sin, that will be the end of me. And Christ will want nothing to do with me. But that's not true. Because Jesus was punished in our place for our sins. God never punishes those who are in Christ because he's already punished Christ. The wrath of God was poured out on the Son of God, not the children of God. Now, it's true. We reap what we sow. Don't ever forget that. There's a wonderful teaching in Scripture. It's, it's a thread through all of Scripture that we will reap what we sow. Sometimes we do something wrong, and there's consequences for that. And that's God's way of helping us learn and grow. Just like sometimes a parent tells a kid, don't do that. And you have to tell them several times not to do that. Until the parent decides, okay, you want to do it, go ahead and do it. And then the kid does it, and all of a sudden the kid's thinking after, after it's done, they have this epiphany, and they say, well, I probably, I probably shouldn't have done that. See, that's where the Bible says in Proverbs and in Hebrews that the father disciplines the children that he loves. It's always in love. It's never in anger. It's never for, it's always for our good, never for our destruction. And it's always that we might grow, not that we would be discouraged. You see, Satan is going to lie to you. He's already lied to some of you, and you think that when you're suffering, God is punishing you. The result is then, you won't remember who you are in Christ. Instead, you have the very sick perspective that to be a Christian is to, is to get crucified. And that's idolatry. Jesus was already crucified. You hear people say things like, well, you know, I need to pay back God for this. I need to suffer for this. Or I brought it on myself. You see, it sounds spiritual, 
but it's really idolatry. Because what you're saying is this. Jesus died, but that's not enough. I need to pay a little bit of this debt myself. No, you don't. You're insufficient. You cannot. Only in Christ do you become complete and sufficient. And then you realize that it's in Christ that everything is paid in full. Some of you say this doesn't make any sense. That's why the Bible calls it grace. Why would God put us in this position of Christ and put Christ in the position of us? He didn't deserve that. We don't deserve it. He didn't do anything wrong. We did everything wrong. It's grace. This is what the Bible means when it uses words like love. God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You see, you're forgiven. You're not... <laughs> I, you know, when I, when I was going over this study again, I, I, I came across this, this little sentence right here. And, and I just shook my head and I did exactly what I'm doing now. You're forgiven. You're not a little forgiven. You're not just half forgiven or partial forgiven. Oh, well, my big toe is forgiven. You're forgiven, period, all of you. God doesn't keep a record against you. It's erased in Christ. And when you sin tomorrow or the next day or the day after that, remember that your identity is not in your sin. Your identity is in the Savior. That you don't need to pay God back. That Christ already has. And that God isn't punishing you. That Christ already was. And then you can live through your identity in Christ. You can be bold enough to confess your sins and humble enough to confess your sins and be forgiven, not only by God, but by others. And stop pretending and blame shifting and hiding and excusing and managing your sin. You will never, ever, ever manage your sin. It is impossible for you, of yourself, to manage your sin. You'll never do it. And start putting your sin to death. Because in Christ, it's already dead. So now we're on number five, in Christ. You can know the will of God. How many of you would love to wake up every day knowing the will of God? Well, in Christ, you can. Ephesians 1.9. Making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth, where? In Christ. So here's my next question. Have you ever been confused about what the will of God is? Have you ever woke up just like, I don't know, what do you want me to do? He says, in Christ, we find the meaning and purpose of life. God, do you want me to work here or work there? Sometimes it's, I want you to work in a way that glorifies Christ. Wherever you work. God, am I going to be sick? Am I going to be healthy? Am I going to be rich? Am I going to be poor? Am I going to be married? Am I going to be single? Sometimes those are the wrong questions. The question always has to be, how do I live in this season in Christ. You see, my purpose may not be rich. It may not be healthy. It may not be married. It may not be successful. But God's purpose, God's will for me, is whatever circumstance I find myself in, is to live out of my identity in Christ. If I'm poor, to live in Christ through poverty. If I'm rich, to live in Christ through generosity. You see, if I'm single, it's to live as Christ did, as a chaste, godly worshiper through singleness. If it's in marriage, then in Christ, I want to love and serve my spouse. If it's infertile, I want to love and serve and endure and perhaps even rejoice in those circumstances in Christ. Or if Christ should give me children, then out of my identity in Christ, 
how do I share the love of Jesus with my kids? You see, we all have the same purpose. He says it. The purpose is to set forth, the purpose is set forth in Christ. Those other things may explain us, but they do not define us. The question should never be, God, what exactly is your perfect, narrow road, detailed step will for my life? It should always be, right now, what does it mean to live my life in Christ? Paul continues with number six. In Christ, you are reconciled, he says in Ephesians 1.10, as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him that's in Christ. Things in heaven and things on earth. How many of you ever felt lonely? How many of you ever felt like far away from God and from people? Sin is separating me from God. Sin is separating me from people. I feel very isolated. I feel very lonely. Reconciliation is not something that I can practically feel or experience or sense in my life. It's not reconciliation. It's alienation. Ever felt that way throughout your life? Where you feel lonely, like you're the only one in a boat. You're the only one going through what you're going through. And because of my sin, God feels so far away. In Christ, you're reconciled. And what this means is, you're reconciled to God the Father in Christ. And you need to believe that. Trust it. Don't doubt it. Don't deny it. And don't disregard it. You see, in Christ, you're reconciled to God. And what this means is, is when you sin, you'll feel like you're distant. But positionally, you're still in Christ. Practically, you may have wondered. But positionally, you're still in Christ. So come back to Christ. Don't think you've walked away so far that you're... Don't ever think that your sin will ever... Make God run away from you. That's never going to happen. Because in Christ, you're reconciled to him. Also, what this means is between Christians is that we are reconciled together in Christ. We were reconciled to God as Christians and we're reconciled to one another as the church. That means if there is a conflict between two Christians, which that never happens. We're perfect. That doesn't happen. Right? They have positionally reconciliation in Christ because Christ died for their sins, so they don't need to kill one another. And Christ rose, and he is the mediator between them and God between them and one another. And what this means, functionally and practically then, is Christians can pause, can pursue reconciliation because the reconciliation is ultimately in Christ. You see, this gives you hope for our earthly relationships and it gives us certainty of our divine relationship. How many of you had difficult, divided relationship with believers right now? The only hope is that the two of you in Christ come together in Christ. He becomes the one who forgives. He becomes the one who suffers. He becomes the one who reconciles. He becomes the one who allows you to live in your identity together in him. Now here's something that I want to make sure you all understand. If you go to a brother and sister in Christ and discuss whatever differences you have, whatever's dividing, that doesn't mean that other individuals in Christ. So you don't put the blame on yourself. This is Jesus working through you. You're doing the right thing. You're trying to reconcile through Christ because Christ is your identity. But that doesn't mean that other individual is going to accept that. That's where you do this, which you shouldn't have had your hands on it to begin with. You do this and say, Father, this is in your hands. Please help. And you leave it there. 
Paul continues. Number seven. In Christ you have an inheritance. This is Ephesians 1.11. In him we have obtained an inheritance. Next question. Have you ever felt cheated, stolen from, disregarded, overlooked? You see, in Christ there's an inheritance. You and I, we tend to be very short-sighted people. God has an inheritance. We get some of it in this life. The rest is awaiting us, is awaiting us in the life to come. You see, when the Bible talks about this life, it calls it a little while. Now, I know when we're in the middle of it, it seems like a long while. But in Christ, there's resurrection from death. In Christ, there's eternal life. In Christ, there's an inheritance that is awaiting you and me. You are one whom God has graced in his life, in this life, and there is an inheritance. It's a physical inheritance where all of your sickness will be gone. It's a spiritual inheritance where your reconciliation with God and others will be perfected. It is an emotional inheritance where you will be filled with everlasting joy. It's also a financial inheritance where you will not be hungry, you will not be poor, you will not be in need forever. There's this great inheritance into Christ. And knowing who you are and knowing where you're going helps you to preserve along the way of the journey. But we want it now, Albert. We want it now. No. God says, your inheritance is in me. I will give you things that you need now, but I will be storing more things for you in your eternal life with me. Paul continues with number eight. In Christ you have hope. This is probably one of the largest things that's going on in our society today. Hope. We live in a world that is extremely hopeless. Has a lot of hopelessness. Let me put the mess at the end of it. In Christ we have hope. And remember what I keep on, I, I try to remind you because it reminds me. Biblical hope is assured. Biblical hope is guaranteed. Worldly hope is a possibility. So we're not talking about the same hope here. Paul says in Ephesians 1.12 that we, that we who are the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. You see, your hope is in Christ. Your hope is not in your government. Your hope is not in your beauty. Your hope is not in your IQ. Your hope is not in your degree. Your hope is not in your marriage. Your hope is not in your children. Your hope is not in your success. Your hope is not in your family. Your hope is not in your friends. And I can go on and on and on and on as far as the world looks at hope. As believers in Jesus Christ, as followers of Jesus, as true Christians, our hope is in one person, in Christ. Your hope alone, forever, has to be, must be, I beg that you would be in Christ. Apart from Christ, there is no hope. If you've been hanging your hope on the economy, there's no hope. If you've been hanging on your hope on morality, <laughs> I'm sorry, there's no hope. If you've been hanging your hope on your friends, your family, your co-workers, your neighbors, your spouse, your kids, your intelligence, your competence, your ability, all of that will fail you. Hope is only in Christ. And I want you to have that hope in Christ and then go to work and then love your friends and then deal with your enemies and then endure your suffering. Whatever God should have for you 
It cannot be that your hope is in someone or something. It has to be that your hope is in Christ. So you can endure anything. That has to be how it is. You see, I get so concerned for those who hang their hope somewhere other than in Christ. Because I know that it would fail, and I know that it's going to fail them. And destroy them, and devastate, and grieve them. Our hope is in Christ. And we have made it through. Lastly, Paul says, in Christ we have the Holy Spirit. People, this is just the introduction. You see, there are 30 times that Paul says this. We just pulled out just nine of them. You see where this is so incredibly important? He keeps saying it in a whole bunch of ways. Ephesians 1.13 In him you also, when you heard the word of truth. You see? And this is the truth. We're reading the word of God. We're hearing the truth. You see, the world is full of lies about God and who God is. About who we are. About our identity. About what our purpose is. About what our destiny is. This is the word of truth. The gospel. The good news. The grace of God. Of salvation and belief. In him. You see, salvation is believing in him. That's where it starts. We're sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. The way you know your identity in Christ is through the presence, the person, the power of the Holy Spirit. He writes the scriptures, he illuminates our understanding, he awakens our awareness, he changes our desires. He refashions our identity. You see, the Holy Spirit is the means by which the power and presence of Christ come into those who are in Christ. You do not, you do not live a life by your own power. You live, a, you live a life by the power of the Holy Spirit. You don't need to muster up your own energy. You don't need to motivate or discipline yourself. You need to allow the Holy Spirit to motivate you and to be filled with the Holy Spirit to live a life of blessing and obedience to God. You see, it's so odd that sometimes we who are in Christ forget that the Holy Spirit is in us. See, we can live functionally as if we're deists, or atheist, as if God was perhaps non-existent or lived, lived far away and was disinterested. God lives in the children of God. God transforms, works from the inside out in the children of God. In Christ, you have the Holy Spirit. He comes with new wisdom. He comes with new passion. He comes with new pleasures. He comes to change you by allowing you to experience the life of Christ. It was the Holy Spirit who empowered the life of Jesus Christ. Jesus' life is not one just to be observed. It's one to be experienced. And his life was lived by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit descended on him in his baptism. The Holy Spirit filled him throughout the course of his life. The Holy Spirit caused him to rejoice. The Holy Spirit led him and also empowered him through trial and temptation, through the suffering and sadness. And it was the Holy Spirit who raised Christ from the dead. How do I know that? Because that's what Scripture teaches. And I want everybody to listen to this very clearly. I want everybody to understand this. The Holy Spirit is not a force. He is a person. He's not impersonal. He is personal. You see, he's not far away. 
He's near. He's not against you. He's for you. He doesn't want you to perform. He wants you to perf perform new life in. He wants to perform new life in you. He doesn't want you to be in lies and in death. He wants you to live a new life on the trust, on the truth that you are in Christ. And when you are in Christ, you have the Holy Spirit. You are someone that you would never be. You see, you can live a life you have never lived. You can do things you would otherwise be incapable of doing. And you can endure suffering that you never thought you could endure. And I want you to think about these things. Study these things. And pray on these things. Ask the Holy Spirit as you read and go through the book of Ephesians to show you, to illuminate, to give you a deeper revelation and to teach you and to transform you about being, having Christ live in you and through you and that's where your identity is. Let's pray. Father, that's exactly what I would like to ask right now. Is that as we go through the book of Ephesians, Father, that the Holy Spirit continually guides us into realizing our identity is solidified in Christ. That our identity is not by our performance or by our success or our failures. It's not by the world. It's not by our family or friends or who somebody else tells us who it is, who we are. <clears throat> that we come to the deeper revelation and acceptance that our identity is in you and only in you. That our hope is only in So, Father, I would truly ask that as we read the book of Ephesians, that your Holy Spirit that is within us just illuminates our vision, illuminates our spiritual understanding of what you had Paul penned down so that we can go forth in a new, transformed way, glorifying you in all things. In Jesus' name.